today on Sun Up. Producers are gearing up for fall planting. Some things that you should think about before putting canola in the ground. And we catch up with Daryl Peel at the Wheatland Stalker Conference. Find out where past and present 4-H'ers are getting together to celebrate a half a century. And why this 4-H group is learning about more than 80 varieties of trees. All next on SUNUP. Hello everyone and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. Turning the calendar to September means fall planting season is almost here. And today, we begin by talking about canola. Here's SUNUP's Dave Deacon. Chad, what are some of the varieties that Oklahoma producers are using? Uh, well, really, when you look over the last four or five years, we've come a long ways with the varieties that we have commercially available. Uh, for one thing, we have, we have a lot more uh, hybrids available uh, to us, which in, in high yielding conditions, so like last year, uh, you know, hybrids really, really shined last year compared to some of the open pollinated varieties. But just, just in general, the, the uh, amount of variety improvement that we've had the last three or four years has been tremendous. What are some of the improvements that we've been seeing? Uh, of course, winter hardiness, which really in Oklahoma now, winter hardiness is not an issue. Uh, you know, we haven't had an extreme winter in a couple winters, but it doesn't appear, as long as stuff's planted in a timely manner, uh, winter hardiness does not seem to be an issue. Uh, and then, of course, herbicide resistance, we see more and more Roundup Ready uh, varieties becoming available, which helps uh, more varieties uh, and hybrids with the, the SU residual tolerance trait, uh, which is important for uh, for those for those producers who have a history of using SU herbicides on their wheat, uh, so th so those are two main critical um, uh, characteristics that we see more and more varieties coming out with. Okay, are are, are you seeing much of a difference uh, as far as row spacing goes? Uh, well, row spacing really has been one of those questions we've had a lot a lot over the last four or five years. Mm -hmm. um, and really the research that we've done anywhere from from 15 to seven and a half inches. Uh, no, no uh, consistent yield differences at all. Uh, and then when we go up to 30 inch rows, sometimes we see a, a yield drag anywhere from zero to 10%. Uh, a lot of that is determined on, you know, what your yield potential is. If, if you're growing uh, 1,500 pound canola, you're probably not gonna see a yield difference between seven and a half, 15 and 30. Uh, however, if you get into that 3,000, 3,500 pound yield potential, that's when you're probably going to see that 5 to 10 percent yield drag. And, and of course, all producers, especially coming out of a drought like we did, producers really need to be thinking about managing the residue in their soil. Uh, that's, that's correct. One, one of the problems when we think specifically about no-till canola uh, is, is residue management. We need to, to remove a little bit of that residue. Uh, from, from the seed row uh, to get a little bit of bare soil showing. Uh, so when you think about last year uh, planting canola in, in the fall of 2011, you know, we were following a, a zero to 20 bushel wheat crop in a lot of areas, so not a lot of residue. However, this year, you know, we're following 40 to 60 or easily, you know, bushel wheat straw. So, so there's about two or three times as much wheat straw as there was last fall. Uh, so we need to think about residue management, how we're gonna manage that, manage that residue when we get ready to plant uh, canola. What are some of the options that producers can do? Um, some of the things that we've had success uh, with over, over the, the last couple of years, one, one of them is using a row crop planter. Mm -hmm. So planting on wider rows, 20 to 30 inch rows, depending on what you're set up with, and, and using row cleaners. So mm -hmm. basically you're, you're removing three to four inches uh, of residue uh, for that seed, seed to come up and get, get some bare soil surface exposed. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, another option would be burning. Uh, we, we, don't, we don't like to, to promote that, right. but, it, but it is an option for, for producers to have in their toolbox. Uh, ideally burn a day or two before you plant. You want to leave that residue there because that's what's, that's what's protecting your soil surface and, and reducing evap evaporative water losses. So, so burning right before planting is, is one option. Uh, the other one would be vertical tillage. Uh, that's work, that worked last year for a few guys. Uh, basically there, you know, you're, you're tying, chopping the, re the residue up a little bit and, and tying it into the soil surface. And in, in most cases, depending on what, what machine you're using or what brand, you're going to get enough bare soil there to, uh, to, 
to get that win canola through the winter. Okay, so so soil management is going to be important this coming year just as it's been in the past couple of years. It is, and probably more so this year because a lot of guys that no-till their canola had success last year mm -hmm. without w without even thinking about residue management just because we had so, so little residue. Uh, but this year, you know, where we have 60 bushel wheat straw laying on the ground, mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be critical because there'll, there'll be a lot of stand loss if somebody just goes in and drills directly into 60 bushel wheat straw. Uh, there, there, there'll be stand loss this winter, no doubt. Okay, thank you much, Chad Gotze with Oklahoma State University. Hi, I'm Al Sutherland with your Mesonet Weather Report. August has been a month of change and variety. The first few days of August were scorchers with daytime highs over 110 degrees in many Oklahoma locations. But by mid-August, even in Oklahoma's hotspot Altus, daytime highs seemed tame, staying below the 100 mark. The 30-day rainfall amounts through August 29th have varied from great in the southeast, the purple and reddish map areas, to meager in the blue areas in the west and the panhandle. The variation really pops out in a percentage of normal rainfall from July 30th through August 28th. The blue areas had close to twice their normal August rainfall. The green areas came in close to normal, while the orange and red areas had less than half their normal rainfall. Most of the rainfall came from storms over the third and fourth weekends in August. A map with the first wave amounts over the weekend of August 18th and 19th shows how the storms moved in bands from the northwest to the southeast with heaviest rains of two and a half or more inches in the tan and brown areas in the southeast. One week later, August 24th and 25th, our rainfall map shows how the storms tracked in the more common direction from the southwest to the northeast with the heavier rains of two and a half or more inches in the tan and brown areas coming down in the northeast. Central Oklahoma came out the winter with rains from these crisscrossing storm tracks. Unfortunately, as welcome as these rains were, they did little to dent our drought conditions. The Keech Byram Drought Index shows just two small areas below 400, both in southeast Oklahoma. Most areas are colored red or purple due to their extremely dry conditions and high index values. And in these dry times, remember that the governor's burn ban is still in effect for all counties in Oklahoma. Checking on plan available water in the top 16 inches of the soil column, we see values of two or more inches of available water in the green colored areas. In the drier brown areas, there is less than an inch of water available for plants. For August and early September, an inch of water will be used up in three to four days. If you haven't seen the new Mesonet Agriculture section, check it out. It sports a new farm monitor that includes Mesonet information for the location you choose, along with a 36-hour forecast and indicators for Mesonet Agriculture Advisories, soil moisture and spraying conditions. Let us know what you think of this latest Mesonet website product by sending us a message. That's easy to do from our Mesonet contact page. Thanks for joining us for this week's Mesonet Weather Report. Well, we've come to the Wheatland Stalker Conference here in Ena today to catch up with Daryl Peel. Daryl, let's talk about the, the feeder cattle prices. What's happened in the market these last couple of weeks? You know, the impact of the drought this summer has pushed feeder cattle prices down pretty dramatically in many cases. They bottomed about a month ago in late July. And if you look at what's happened, they've, they've come back this last month, particularly for the lightweight calves. The heavier weight feeder cattle have not increased very much in price. They're pretty much where they were. But the, the lightweight calves have gone up, which means that part of that price line, if you will, if you look at price by weight for feeder cattle, has gotten much steeper. And so those lightweight calves are very expensive. The heavyweights are staying down. 
Uh, and so it's changed the price structure there when you think about that from a stocker standpoint in particular in terms of buy versus sell prices. All right, so, so looking at those prices, what does that mean for what guys are traditionally doing this year, or this time of year as, as they're, they're starting to pull in animals? Well, you know, you know, we're thinking about planting wheat. We've gotten some rain. We have some prospects, at least, for, for wheat pasture. If that comes through, we're going to be looking to buy cattle in the next 60 days, let's say, depending on who you are. Um, traditionally, we like to buy, you know, we have a, a long tendency in Oklahoma to buy these lightweight calves, four-weight kind of, you know, animals, put a couple hundred, 250 pounds of gain on them in the winter grazing period. If you look at that price structure that's out there right now, there's a very sharp break in that price structure that happens between 500 and 600, 550 and 600 pounds for steers. And so what happens is that there's actually, if you, if you work out the incentives, if you work out the alternatives, there's a pretty strong incentive out there to buy a heavier weight animal. Instead of buying a four weight, you might want to buy a, a mid to high five weight or even a low six weight animal. Okay. And in this market structure, because of high corn prices, you can take those animals to bigger weights on the other end so you're okay going to 850 pounds, maybe right. even to 900 pounds if, if you can, can get there. And there's very little discount on those, on those big end animals. And so the best value of gain at the market today, and I think it will stay this way for the fall, will be on a bigger than traditional stock round. All right, so definitely a good year to consider a new business plan. But as we head into the fall, what are we looking for? What are the triggers? What could change that scenario for us? Well, it's all depending right now on that uh, corn cost and, the, and, the, and that translates into the cost of gain at the feedlot level. And that's really what drives the entire price structure for cattle all the way from about 550 pounds up through the fed cattle level. And so we're at a point right now where the cost of gain at the feedlots is very close to as much as the fed cattle price or the heavyweight feeder cattle price. They're all about the same level. And if, and if the cost of gain goes up a little bit more, you could start to actually invert that market. By invert, I mean we could actually see the lighter weight or the middle weight feeder cattle, a 550 to 600 pound animal, actually get cheaper than the heavier weight feeder cattle. And, uh, and you would actually be rolling up the price instead of rolling it down as you put weight on those animals. The point is, we don't know if that's gonna happen, but we're very close to that point where that could happen. And so what it means is that producers really have to watch this market for the dynamics that are out there for the next few months. It could change pretty dramatically. All right, good information and plenty to keep an eye on. Daryl Peel, our Livestock Marketing Specialist. Every baby calf is born with an immune system but doesn't have the antibodies floating around in his bloodstream that can give him some, some early disease protection. And that's where what we call passive immunity comes into play. Passive immunity comes when that calf nurses mama for the very first time and gets colostrum. Colostrum, the first milk that the cow gives right after delivering that calf, contains very large proteins called immunoglobulins and those become the antibodies that help the calf get some disease protection as he consumes that colostrum and then as those antibodies are absorbed through the intestine and go into the bloodstream. The important part about this is that that process changes pretty rapidly over time. You see the intestine goes through a process we call intestinal closure where it loses the capability of absorbing those very large proteins and will then be less likely to give that calf disease protection if he doesn't get those antibodies or those immunoglobulins in time. Therefore, during this fall calving season, if you have some calves that are born to say first calf heifers that aren't giving very much milk or go through a long delivery process and that calf is just too sluggish to get up to nurse the cow, and we need to supply some colostrum, either natural colostrum that we get from another cow or commercial colostrums that we can buy. We need to try to get that into that calf within the first six hours after he's born. As you'll see by this particular graphic from some research done quite a long time ago, you can see that the percentage of those uh, antibodies that are being absorbed drops rather dramatically from about two-thirds within the first six hours, clear down to less than 50% if he doesn't get it when he's 12 hours old. By the time that calf is a full day or 24 hours of age, his ability to absorb those antibodies is really quite low. So we need to give that calf that needs a little extra help some colostrum early, 
within the first six hours of life to give him the best chance to have some disease protection, to survive until weaning, until we can sell him perhaps next year. Hey, we hope this gives you some idea as to how to save a few more calves during this fall calving season. And I look forward to visiting with you again next week on Sunup's Cow Calf Corner. Kim Anderson, our grain marketing specialist, joins us now. And Kim, we've been off for the past couple of weeks. We want to get up to speed on everything. And the big question, is corn still king? Corn's still the dominant factor in the market, but I don't believe uh, that corn is still king. I think the situation has changed. Uh, you got corn and, uh, and wheat still trading in their dollar, dollar range, respectively. But wheat has earned some independence from corn. Okay, let's talk now about some of the uh, dynamics that are behind that, some of the factors that you're looking at. Well, wheat stocks have tightened up a little bit, uh, and mainly in, in the foreign market, international markets. Uh, you can go uh, to uh, uh, Russia, Ukraine. The talk is that they may uh, limit their exports or may suspend exports. I read one commentary that uh, they'll run out of export or exportable wheat at least by the end of October. Uh, they may cut it sooner. And that, that limits the supply of wheat in the world market, makes the U.S. wheat, which right now is about $20 a ton, about 54 cents a bushel priced above the world market, but it'll bring the demand back in for our exportable wheat. And that makes wheat prices to a certain degree independent of corn. Okay, and without question, there's some U.S. factors going on as well regarding harvest and some of the percentages there. Uh, you bet there, with, especially with corn. Uh, you know, we've what, got 15, 20 percent of the corn harvested, so there's a lot of uncertainty about how much corn uh, we're going to, going to be able to harvest. There's concern right now about the uh, hurricane and the rain that's coming through. Uh, will that reduce uh, corn stocks a little bit? That supports corn prices, and so what we see is if uh, wheat stocks are tight enough, if corn prices go up, wheat prices go up, or if wheat, something happens to wheat, uh, wheat prices will go up and corn will follow wheat. So you've got both corn and wheat. Either one of those uh, markets can, can uh, changes in the supply and our demand situation can result in higher prices. Okay, you talked a little bit about that dollar spread. What is the range there? Well, if we're looking at the Kansas City Board of Trade December contract, uh, it's uh, $8.69 on the bottom, nine fifty seven on top. Chicago uh, December contract for corn, $7.50 on the bottom, eight forty nine on the top. There is probably support for corn at, at 786, uh, say light, re, light support there and heavy support at the 750. If you're watching the July contract uh, for the 13 harvest is 825 and 890. Okay, and we like to always end with some marketing advice for our Oklahoma producers. Well, if they're looking at uh, pricing uh, 2013 wheat, either hedging or forward contracting, you know, with these prices, you may want to do 10 or 15 percent of that. But any hedge or forward contracted product, make sure you've got crop insurance to cover that. If you still have wheat in the bin, uh, you know, it's going to wallow around for a while. It's going to be a couple weeks before we know the direction of the market. You may want to sell some now if you're antsy about it. If not, just follow your plan, sell it in, uh, in September, October, and then the last, last of it in the November, December time period. Okay, good advice. Kim Anderson, we'll see you next week. Thanks a lot. Hi, welcome to Shop Stop. Today we want to talk about pop rivets, the difference between steel and aluminum mandrels, as well as some other items. Okay, what, what the difference are, is that, uh, of course, on the aluminum mandrel, this, this nail-looking piece uh, is aluminum, and on this one, the nail-looking piece is, is steel, and when you put them in your pop rivet gum and start squeezing it, it keeps compressing this until this nail-looking thing actually breaks. And obviously, the aluminum is going to break a lot faster than the, uh, than the steel will, so it's going to have not near the clamping force. But it's a great way for uh, securing two pieces of sheet metal together, and we'll kind of demonstrate here how that works. Um, first of all, I'm going to show you what happens when you squeeze the pop rivet gun. You can see that the mandrel is being sucked up into the, to the rivet itself, and once it tightens up against the, the sheet metal, it will eventually snap that in two and it, and it pops off, hence the pop rivet gun. So we'll insert that. 
we're going to fasten these two pieces of sheet metal together. So there you have it, uh, sheet metal pop riveted together. One thing you want to certainly make sure of is when you're pop riveting it is that this, uh, the flange here stays flush against that piece of sheet metal when you're tightening it up. So that's how you can use a pop rivet gun to fasten sheet metal together. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Shop Stop. And joining me now is Jim Rutledge from the Oklahoma 4-H Foundation. Jim, first of all, for folks who aren't familiar, tell us what the foundation is. Well, the 4-H Foundation is a private, nonprofit foundation which has as its sole purpose support of the Oklahoma 4-H program. All right, and you're coming up on a pretty important anniversary now. We were organized in 1962, so this is 50 years that we've been there to support 4-H through all kinds of different programs. All right, now what kind of support do you do? Well, one of our big programs is 4-H scholarships. We do over 50,000 in scholarships on an annual basis, and then we also support county enhancement grants, uh, support for volunteer development, uh, trips to National 4-H Congress, National Conference, uh, all kinds of different programs that support 4-H members and volunteers. Very good. Now, to celebrate that anniversary, tell us what's going on. Well, we're having a special event on Saturday, September 22nd. It'll be a 4-H homecoming, and the main idea is that we want to get all the people that have ever been involved in the 4-H Foundation or have ever benefited from the 4-H Foundation to come to Stillwater on that Saturday afternoon. And we've got a full day of activities planned. We're going to start with registration about 11 o'clock. There'll be time to visit with your friends. There'll be a barbecue lunch about noon. And then uh, the special feature for this uh, homecoming celebration will be tours of some of the newest athletic facilities here at OSU. Very nice. All right, now folks, if you want to get information on that and if you'd like to attend, come to our website, sunup.okstate.edu. We'll have a link for you there. Staying on the subject of 4-H, our sunup intern Mindy Andrus caught up with a group of high school students who are especially interested in learning about trees. Bark patterns, leaf textures, and fruit buds. No, these aren't a few of my favorite things, but they are a few of the ways to identify the trees on the 4-H forestry list. Alicia Brintz is coaching her 10th team for the National Forestry Competition, held in Weston, West Virginia. 4-H'ers between the ages of 14 to 19 can take part. Tree identification is not for the faint of heart. On our national list and state list, we have 30 insects and we have 19 different uh, diseases which they have to study. And they have 81 trees they have to study. So it's, it's quite a chore to, to learn all those. And they have to spell them all right too. <laughs> the team stopped by Oklahoma State's Arboretum to prepare for the national contest. Extension Forestry Specialist Craig McKinley introduced the team to species of trees they may not have seen before. Well, what we'd like to do with this particular session is to show them trees that they don't have growing native down in southeast Oklahoma because this is an arboretum and we do have some rather exotic species out here. Uh, behind us is a, is a royal polonia, which is on their list, but it's not native to this part of the country at all. Tyler Burton and his teammates are the 2012 state representatives going to nationals. The contest also features quiz bowls, test, measuring saw logs, and compass pacing, which is Tyler's favorite. Uh, you get a compass with a mirror on the back of it, and you pretty much just point to the little flag they have and change the bearings and line it up and just get the degrees and pace it out. Tyler and the team get a lot more out of this than just tree knowledge. You actually have them have to commit themselves, time and effort, to do well at a certain activity. And I've often believed through 4-H, FFA type activities, those are very important attributes that people can learn. They, they have to work, they have to be dedicated. The skills and lessons they learn will continue to help them grow. So logging in our part of the country is a major income. And it's just 
all out there for them. It's just an open field for them. So, and I encourage them and push them all the way I can. That's why I've stayed at it for so many years. <laughs> This small town team from Fort Towson, Oklahoma placed 11th in the nation. Tyler Burton placed first in the log cutting and Dylan Payne placed first in the log rolling. For Sun Up, I'm Mindy Andrus. Before we leave today, a look ahead at what you'll see next week on Sun Up. Some basic things you need in a cattle handling facility. You also need to keep it in good repair. Our one-on-one -on -one interview with Temple Grandin, a woman who helped revolutionize the way livestock are handled. We caught up with Temple at the Southern Plains Beef Symposium in Ardmore. Years I've talked about the distractions you got to get out of your facility. Why do I have to keep talking about this 35 years later? Grandin has worked for more than 30 years redesigning livestock facilities and helping us all better understand animal behavior. Join us as we begin our special conversation with Temple Grandin next week on SUNUP. And that does it for us this week. Remember, you can see us anytime at sunup.okstate.edu. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. I'm Lyndall Stout. We'll see you next time.